For all of those of you who are able, would you please rise for the reading of the word? This is Matthew 1, 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, before they, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Praise be to God. Have a seat. Thank you, Jack. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Why do people celebrate Christmas? Why do people celebrate Christmas? For some, it's a type of a time of delight, fun, and celebratory glee. Beautiful lights on affluent homes. Wonderful presents stacked high under ornamented trees. Movies full of imagination and hope. This is one of the things Christmas was for me as a child growing up. A time for excitement, fun, play, and gifts. Now I'm going to do myself a favor and grab my glasses, which I forgot to do. Be patient with me. For other people, though, Christmas is a time of leisure with family, a time to take a break from worry and the job, a time for children to take a break from the rigors of school and study and spend more time with parents and grandparents. For still others, Christmas is a time of tradition, a time to follow pathways from the past, celebratory pathways that differ from the rest of the year. Now, uh, each of these reasons for Christmas and why people celebrate can be good, and I'm not criticizing any of them. I like to wrap presents, too. Those things are the wrapping on presents. But you noticed I asked, why do people celebrate Christmas? What if I asked you a different question? Why do the people of God celebrate Christmas? What if I asked you, why do the faithful celebrate Christmas? What if I asked you, why do believers celebrate Christmas? Would your answer be the same? Why do the people of God, the faithful, the believers celebrate Christmas? One of the best answers is given in Scripture in Matthew 121, which is our verse today. Please turn with me there and read. Please read with me at Matthew 121. This is ESV version. It says there, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for, or because, you could translate either way from Greek, for he will save his people from their sins. This is important. Nothing could be more important for people. Uh, 
do you realize day to day that nothing could be more important for you than being saved from your sins? We need to stay focused on this. We need to stay focused on Jesus during the Christmas season. Now, uh, there's a dark side that has formed around Christmas and lives off of the grace and capital of Christmas. It's called materialism. It's money. Many retailers make about 50% of their revenue for the year, the entire year, off of Christmas, off of the Christmas season. That's incredible when you think about it. From Black Friday right up until Christmas Eve, they sell. It also means that people are buying things that they want, not necessarily things that they need. If they needed them, they'd have bought them earlier in the year. Hence, I say materialism. Some of these same retailers are trying to change the name of Christmas to the holidays. This is not only an affront to Christianity, it's downright against their business self-interests. It's killing the golden goose, is what it is. Christmas is Christmas because of Christmas, and Christmas is Christmas because of Christ. In other words, you can't extract syrup from the ground. You must extract syrup from the tree. I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm not a minister of materialism. That means my first goal is always to lift up the name of Christ. So hands off Christmas, hands off the name of Christmas, hands off trying to change the name of this time of year to the holidays. Holidays are great, but this is the Christmas season, and Christ came to save his people, his people, from their sins. Now, you just heard a long practical example of this as I talked about materialism. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that Christ came, that he died for our sins, and that he rose. Thank you that he ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father and that he mediates for us. He mediates for our sins as we confess. Thank you, Lord, that we have such a great Savior, such a great Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate his birth at this time of year. Help us to learn today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you're a guest today, you, it, depending on your, your, uh, your, how, you, how, mu- how long you like to sit and your attention span, you might have caught a break because my typical sermon is about 45 to 50 minutes, but today you're probably 25, 30 minutes because we're going to have our meeting afterwards. We're going to end a little early today. Our sermon title today is Recognizing Jesus in Christmas Jesus saves his people from their sins. Recognizing Jesus, think about that very carefully, because maybe you're going through Christmas right now without recognizing Jesus in Christmas. Recognizing Jesus in Christmas, Jesus saves his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21. And point one of our sermon is cleansing from sin, And we'll draw on Zechariah 13.1. Point two is atonement for sin. We'll draw on Isaiah 53.6 and 2 Corinthians 5.21. And point three is forgiving and forgetting sin. We'll draw on Jeremiah 31.31-34. Jesus, the quote-unquote reason for the season, cleanses you from sin, atones for your sin, and makes it possible that God forgives and forgets your sin. Think about that. That God forgives and forgets your sin. 
That's a Christmas present. That's the Christmas present of true life and a relationship with God. Point one now, cleansing from sin. Please turn to Zechariah 13.1. Did you bring your Bible? If not, there's one in the pew in front of you. Zechariah 13.1. Zechariah is, uh, the se- I think, the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Just go tr- towards the end of the Old Testament. You'll probably find Zechariah or look, look up at the screen. Uh, I don't... This says cleanings from sin up there, but it's not cleanings from sin. That sounds like what you do at the dentist. It's cleansing from sin. Cleansing from sin. Zechariah 13.1. On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. The people's uncleanness comes largely from idolatry. How many of you recognize that there is idolatry all around you in this society? Okay, good. How many of you recognize that there's idolatry maybe closer, sometimes idolatry in your own life? Okay, good. Very good. Good. Idolatry is rampant now. An idol is anything that you love more than God. Think about what I'm saying to you. An idol is anything that you love more than God. How many Americans love God more than their house, more than money, more than their jobs. I don't mean the day-to-day of the job. I mean the benefits of the job, maybe. How many Americans love God more than their possessions? How many teenagers love God more than they love their phone? That's a real question and young adults, and maybe even older adults. Uh, You you take God away, you say to a younger person, or maybe even some adults, you say, no more worship in church. They say, great. Man, I can be at home watching the World Cup right now. Great. You take away a teenager's phone... And get ready for World War III. You touch that phone and you get ready for a battle like you would not believe. You know what that means? That means the phone's an idol. How many children love God more than video games? Most spend less than an hour a week with God and spend 20 plus hours a week on video games. Idolatry has, has swept across this land. You know, I heard this, uh, I heard this, uh, incidentally, I'm not Korean, if you didn't know that. I heard this, I heard this uh, about uh, six months ago. The Korean government had made a law that no one under 18 could be on the internet between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. It's illegal, like doing drugs or something. Illegal. Good idea. Great idea. When is our government going to start protecting our kids? Idolatry has swept across the land. As it did in ancient Israel, so it does in America today. The prophet Zechariah predicts not only the coming of Christ, but that Jesus will cleanse us from our idolatry. Now, we all, me too, we've got to understand something. Jesus saves you from your sin. He saves you. He saves me. Therefore, Jesus cleanses you from idolatry. Husbands, No more pornography. 
because you love Jesus. He cleanses you from your idolatry. Wives, no more closets full of shoes. Why? Because you love Jesus. He died for your sins. He cleanses you from idolatry. Teenagers, children, and parents, no more phone and social media more than hours and hours a day, more than other things that are more important in life like faith and family. Why? Because you love Jesus. He died for your sins. He cleanses you from idolatry. Point two now, atonement for sin. Substitutionary atonement for sin. Isaiah 53, 6. Isaiah says, and this is a great reminder to all of us, this would even be a reminder to Billy Graham, this would even be a reminder to Chuck Swindoll, this would even be a reminder to the Pope. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah, Isaiah, who art thou, Isaiah? Isaiah foretold the future about Jesus and substitutionary atonement. This is part of who Isaiah is. The Lord has laid on him, on Christ, the iniquity of us of us all, says Isaiah. What a burden to carry. What a burden did Jesus carry? Jesus, sin bearer. Jesus, the one who is born on Christmas Day, the one after whom Christmas is named, the one who will save his people from their sins. The way Jesus saves you from your sins is by atoning for your sins. The first point I mentioned earlier was that Jesus saves you from your sins by cleansing you from your sins. Now I say that Jesus saves you from your sins by atoning for your sins. Uh, I remember the first time I heard and conceptualized that Jesus took my place on the cross and died for my sins. I was about 28 years old then. Can, Can you raise your hand if you remember If you won't raise your hand, I'm going to ask people to stand up. Can you raise your hand if you remember the day that you understood in your mind, in your heart, that Jesus actually took your place on the cross? Thank you. That's a very important day. The day that you realize that. Isn't that an important day? Isn't that a day like the birth of Jesus Christ in your own heart? That's an important day. It was an astonishing thought to me at 28. I'd studied philosophy and political science and religion at elite schools, but I was still absolutely blown away, just blown away. I mean, I had hair then. I had a lot of hair then. Actually, back then, and when I was in grad school the first time, my hair like went back down to the bottom back here. You wouldn't believe it if you saw a picture. You can probably get Kathleen to show you one. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. She might be embarrassed. But, but I was blown away. My hair blew back by the fact that Jesus actually took my place on the cross and died for my sins. I know it's true. But not just intellectually. In my feelings, in my soul, in my spirit. I know that Jesus took my place on the cross and died for my sins. He atoned for my sins. Jesus saves his people from their sins. By his cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, saves people from their sins. Now, Isaiah was, uh, if I can say it this way, a man ahead of his time, way ahead of his time. He could, he could see the future. He was a prophet, right? He was a man way ahead of his time, if ever there was one. Let's read verse 53, 6 again. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, 
and the Lord has laid on Jesus, on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah knows there is no good in any one of us. You want to do yourself a a favor in your day-to-day life? How many of you pray before bed? Right before. I mean, just right before you're falling asleep. How many of you pray? I don't mean protect me from bad dreams, although that, that wouldn't be the worst thing to pray for, but right before. One thing you should, inc- you should pray right before bed, and one thing you should include, in- and you should pray right when you wake up, and one thing you should include in your prayers right before bed is a confession about who you are to God. And it comports perfectly with the Lord's Prayer. There's no inconsistency here. Lord, I am nothing. Lord, I am weak. Lord, I need to put my heart and my mind, I need to settle it on you and what you want. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? God, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. It comports, obviously, recognizing who you are, a weak sinner. All of us, every one of us. Isaiah 2. Paul 2. Peter 2. Chuck Swindoll 2. Jerry Falwell 2. A weak sinner saved from their sins by Jesus Christ. Isaiah knows there's no good in any one of us. Jeremiah knew it too. He said it in Jeremiah 17, or what we call Jeremiah 17. There's no good in any of us, not one of us. We've all turned astray, and yet Jesus will bear all of our sins. Praise God. So why should you personally, why should we celebrate Christmas? Because Jesus came, was born, and saved you and your family from your sins. He bore your iniquities. He suffered and died in your place so that you might be healed. In fact, let's go ahead and read verses 4 to 6 of Isaiah 53, just a little bit more. You get a little bit better a feel of the scope of this. Surely Christ, he, surely he Christ, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And look carefully, and with, or even by, you could translate there. Definitely you could translate by from Greek there. And with, or by his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, if, if, if you can, flip in your Bible to 2 Corinthians 5.21. We're talking about Jesus atoning for our sins, and this is the reason we celebrate Christmas. This is the reason, the coming of Christ. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. When the Christmas season comes, I know, it, look, um, I walked at 4 a.m. this morning for 40 minutes, and I walked at 6 a.m. this morning for 40 minutes, and then I had breakfast. And one of the reasons I enjoy walking at 4 a.m. is because there's nobody else out there. The cold doesn't bother me because I grew up in northern Illinois. There's nobody else out there, and I'm walking along, and you know what I love to see? I love to see all the houses, all the houses with lights on them. I love to see all the Christmas lights. I love to see all the decorations. I love all of that. And I just walk by the houses and I just look. I look. I stare. I stare at them. If somebody looked out the window, then they might think I'm, you know, thinking about scoping out their house or something. 
you know, but I'm staring at the lights. I love Christmas lights. But, brothers and sisters, we so easily get caught up in the hype. What we need to get caught up in is Jesus. He atoned for your sins. He saves you from your sins. Point three now, forgiving and forgetting. Forgiving and forgetting. How many of you have forgiven someone, but you've never forgotten what they did to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's harder? Forgiving or forgetting? They're both hard, right? But this is forgiving and forgetting. Jesus is born and saves us from our sins because in Christ God forgives us and forgets our sins. Please turn to Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new covenant, in Christ a new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. And you know, the reason I can say that in Christ is because uh, Hebrews 8, 6 through 12 says that very plainly. It recounts the same verses. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, verse 33, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them and I will write it on their hearts, right? The Spirit of Christ does this. We learn this in Ezekiel. This relates to John 3. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 34, this is our, our main verse here. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And here's the key. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. At the end, right here, we see the reason stated why we will know God and be in right relationship with him. It is because he forgives our iniquities and he will remember our sin no more. In Christ, in Christ, he will forgive our iniquities and remember our sin no more. Now, we just saw the kids up here. I love seeing the kids participate in service. I love seeing the kids sing. I love see the, seeing the kids uh, happy at this time of year. Do you remember when you were a kid and you did something wrong with your parents? Do you remember that? Where's Nirov at? Nirov, you remember that? Yes. See, I knew I could get an answer out of him. Beth? Do you remember that? Good. Mike, do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when each of these persons grew up, I mean, child rearing was a little bit firmer than today, right? But how did it feel if your parents did not remember the thing that you did wrong? Do you remember that? You did something wrong. I mean, the proverbial get your hand in the cookie jar, or maybe you, maybe you said a bad word. Oh my gosh, a bad word. How many spankings was a bad word worth in, 19, in the 1960s or 70s? A lot, let me tell you. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Not like today, right? Do you remember, though, when you'd been punished for doing something wrong and you knew your parents were still mad at you? But then do you remember when you could see a visible change in them? Maybe it took six hours. Maybe it took 12 hours. Maybe it took a day. Maybe it took a week, depending on their disposition. But you could see 
when they were no longer mad at you anymore. They were no longer upset at you for what you'd done wrong. That feels great. It feels great to know that God the Father is no longer upset with us for our sins. In Christ, he's not. It felt so good when your mom and dad forgave you for what you did wrong and your relationship with them was back to normal and you no longer needed to fear being punished. It felt great. It felt great. It felt great for me, I'll tell you. It felt great for me. When you celebrate Christmas this year, when you celebrate Jesus' birth, remember Jesus' name, that's what we see in Matthew one twenty one. Jesus' name means he saves his people from their sins. How does he do it? One, he cleanses you from your sins. Two, he atones for your sins. And three, he even makes it possible that God the Father forgives and forgets your sins. All in all, you're back in right relationship with God. You're restored and reconciled to God Because Jesus came, was born, he incarnated. So uh, presents are great. Physical presents are really great. Clothes, jewelry, toys, and other presents are great. They're great. But the greatest present of Christmas, the greatest present of the birth and coming of Jesus Christ, is that you and your family are saved from your sins by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So look to the spirit of Christ this year and always, not to the spirit of materialism. Let's pray. Small s spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love. So often we can forget who Jesus Christ really is. He, he's, he's, he's more than a man. He's more than a teacher. He's more than a prophet. He says he's more than that. He's more than a prophet. He's our Savior. He's our Savior. At Christmas time, we celebrate that Jesus, our Savior, came and that he saved us from our sins. So, Lord, Please help us. Sin is an unpopular concept today in this society. That doesn't make it less real. It just means it's even more rampant. Lord, help us to concentrate our hearts and minds prayerfully on the Lord, recognizing day to day that he saves us from our sins. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.